Are you feeling lonely and don't have enough social contact with others? Very large numbers of people would answer yes, especially at this painful time. And that was true even before coronavirus. Loneliness was a cause of great suffering. One major survey conducted in 2018 found that about one in four Americans said they often or always felt lonely or left out or isolated. So we're not alone in this. Polls in Europe also found similar results. The loneliness pandemic, Norina Hertz. What's clear is that loneliness levels have significantly and not surprisingly increased, particularly, it turns out, amongst the young women and those on low income. These three groups have been disproportionately affected. Our show is about fixes. Yeah, how to make the world a better place. How How do do we we fix fix it? it? How do we fix it? Human beings are social creatures. Connections with others are vital for our health and well-being. But loneliness is on the rise around the world. Right. You know, we're surrounded by so much technology and social media, but we still feel disconnected from others. And feeling alone can have a real toll on your health and even your sense of meaning in life. It's more than possible, I think, that it's even played a role in the recent rise of political extremism. So our guest is Norina Hertz, an English economist, thought leader, and best-selling author. Her new book, just published, is The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart. Norina joins us from London. Welcome to How Do We Fix It? Thank you so much for having me on. So loneliness is not the same thing as being alone. What is it? So... The way I define loneliness is loneliness is in part feeling disconnected from your friends and family, yearning that they see you, hear you, care for you, but feeling that they don't. But it's also, the way I define it, feeling disconnected from your government and from your workplace, feeling that your fellow citizens, your employer, your government aren't seeing or hearing you as well. So the way I define loneliness is as a state of being that is personal, but also political, um, existential and economic, driven by a whole host of external factors, as well as, of course, the choices we make ourselves. You mentioned Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, Britain's former chief rabbi who died recently. He had a big influence over the way I think about life. And he said a fundamental truth about humankind is as old as the Hebrew Bible itself. We were not meant to live alone. Was he right? Well, it's actually the first time in the Bible that we're told what we shouldn't do is in this context in Genesis, man should not be alone. And we were never designed to be alone um, in evolutionary terms. It's why being alone has such a strong physiological response, not only a psychological response. Um, Because we are hardwired to connect, when we're lonely, what happens is that we go essentially into a state of fight or flight. We've been designed for it to be a very uncomfortable feeling. So our stress levels go up, our cortisol levels go up, our blood pressure goes up. All of these things intended to tell us, go and find other people, hunt and gather with others, build communities. Things that nowadays, many of us, unfortunately, are not doing. Especially right now. You say we're creatures of togetherness, but we're living at the moment in a world of social distancing. And how do you see the pandemic affecting our culture during this period? So we now have a body of research that has come out just in the last few weeks. And what's clear is that loneliness levels have significantly and not surprisingly increased, particularly, it turns out, amongst the young women and those on low income. These three groups have been disproportionately affected. The young is is a group we typically actually don't think about as being lonely, but the young in recent years have been the loneliest generation. 
Um, and that was something that my research uncovered, which which surprised me. I'd always thought maybe it was the elderly who were the loneliest and um, stuck without their college mates or schoolmates, um, unable to socialize. You know, they are feeling particularly lonely. Women feeling particularly lonely because they are unfortunately a proportion are trapped in relationships that can be incredibly lonely. A bad relationship is worse, arguably, than being in no relationship at all. And people on low incomes feeling disproportionately uncared for during this pandemic, um, disproportionately marginalized. Loneliness among young people, uh, why? Why are young people, even before the pandemic, why were they more likely to be lonely than before? So our smartphones are clearly part of the problem. And if you look at the data on loneliness amongst young people, what we see is that it really starts rising very significantly and continuously um, as smartphone usage increases amongst this demographic. And about a year and a half ago, Stanford University ran a very important study where they had 3,000 people, 1,500 used their social media as usual. The other 1,500 were told to go off Facebook for two months. The results were very clear. The group who went off Facebook were significantly less lonely, but also significantly happier and did significantly more with each other face to face and studies that have been replicated since have found very similar results with different platforms as well. And you interviewed a lot of young people for your book. So Peter, this 14 year old boy, told me about how he would post on Instagram and then be waiting, waiting, waiting for somebody to like one of his posts. And when they didn't, saying to himself, what am I doing wrong? feeling so invisible, or Claudia, the 16-year-old girl who told me about how her friends had said that they weren't going to go out after high school one evening, and she was back in her room, and she was scrolling through her feeds, and she saw them all going out on their feeds, having fun without her. She refused to go to school for a week. She hid in her room because she felt so unpopular. Social media, often a place where bullying and um Hate is really rife. In the United Kingdom, a study showed that 65% of UK college students have directly experienced cyberbullying. Is this mostly a problem in Western countries? That's a great question. And um, there is research which shows that the more individualistic a society is, the lonelier it is. And the West is typically more individualistic than many non-Western countries, yet loneliness exists and is on the rise in non-Western countries too, with serious loneliness epidemics now as far afield as um, Japan, India, South Africa, and China. I was really struck in the book with your description of all oh, the old people in prison in Japan. What's going on there? Yeah, so that's a very sobering uh, story. I found out that the fastest growing demographic being incarcerated in Japanese jails are the elderly. And when, when researchers have looked at why this is, what they found is that loneliness is often playing a very significant role in this because elderly people, significant numbers, are intentionally committing relatively minor crimes like shoplifting in order to be jailed so that they can find company and connection um, when, when they don't have it in their, in their external lives. And as much as 40% um, of these um, people who've recently been incarcerated say that they live on their own and that they don't have friends or family who they can reach out to. Norina, what are the health impacts of loneliness? So when you're lonely, chronically lonely, you have a 30% higher chance of getting a heart attack, 30% chance of getting dementia. You're significantly more likely to have a stroke. In fact, researchers have found that loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, and what's really worrying in the context of the pandemic is that researchers have found that even relatively short periods of loneliness, so periods of loneliness and isolation that are less than two years, 
have a marked impact on life expectancy. You also point out that when people are lonely, they're more vulnerable to populist political messages. They have, a, I guess, a craving to belong. How do you see that playing out in our political situation today? This was actually the jumping off point for me writing this book. I've been researching the rise of right wing populism across the globe. And one of the things that kept on coming up time and time again from my interviews was how lonely they felt, how lonely they felt that is until they had found community in the right wing populists, whether it's Le Pen in France, whether it's Salvini in Italy or whether it was Trump in the United States. And and then I dug into the academic literature on this. And what I found was that there is a significant empirical body of research that supports this too, showing that people who are more socially isolated are more likely to vote for right wing populists, people who have less friends, they feel disproportionately marginalized, forgotten, ignored, unseen, unheard. And of course, populist leaders have very effectively spoken directly to that. If you think about Trump or Le Pen's rhetoric, you know, often talking about the forgotten people, how they're the only people who can hear them. And these messages really landing with this constituency. And yet here again, such messages land more with the lonely because the lonely um, disproportionately see the world as a hostile place, disproportionately see the world as a threatening place in which outsiders are to be feared rather than welcomed in. The lonely are also disproportionately more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. To be clear, I'm not saying, of course, that everyone who is lonely um, falls into this category, just that you're disproportionately more likely to. Joe Biden, in his inaugural address, made a, a quite compelling and strong plea for unity, for national unity and for being in this together. But he didn't mention loneliness. And it's very rare for politicians, especially in America, to talk about the lack of community and loneliness. Do you think they're missing an opportunity to, to bring us together? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, and it was such a powerful speech. And I, too, really remarked upon the fact that he said to overcome the challenges and secure the future, we need one thing, unity. Um, but unity is, of course, about having strong communities. Unity is about bringing different people together. And there are so many things that governments can do to address this. So many things that are actually going on across the world. Um, because America isn't exceptional. It's yeah, exactly. yeah, we, 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 always like, we always like to think we are exceptional. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about some of your solutions, because we're a show about solutions. This is How Do We Fix It? I'm Richard Davies. And I'm Jim Meggs. Coming up, more with Narina Hertz. Before we get to solutions, I have one other question or concern for you, and that is working from home. There are a lot of indications that as the pandemic comes to an end, the tendency towards working at home might endure in many industries, particularly ones what so-called knowledge workers. What do you see as the long-term impact of that? Well, there was an initial euphoria amongst some when people initially began to work from home um, at the beginning of the pandemic. But now, all these months on, you really see it taking its toll, taking its toll on employees' mental health, motivation, productivity, creativity. And we're seeing significant numbers of employees now feeling incredibly lonely. E even before the pandemic, 40% of office workers were lonely. So, so I would really caution against institutionalizing working from home. Instead, I'd say companies should be really trying to think about how, when we come back to the office, do we make it them feel, our office feel more connected and our employees feel more connected? Because loneliness comes at a significant business cost. Lonely workers are less productive, less efficient, less motivated, and more likely to quit than lonely than workers who are not lonely. Another factor in loneliness is the physical lack of community. In the United States since the 1960s, we've seen a long-term decline in town centers. They've often been replaced by shopping centers and malls on the outskirts of towns. To what extent does the car and zoning or planning play into loneliness? 
a really significant role. I have a whole chapter on the loneliness of the city where I really explore this uh, in depth because cities designed for cars, not for people, are never going to be cities that people feel connected to each other in. And there have been some great initiatives which have sought to address this in Barcelona, for example, in Spain. These what are called super blocks have been set up. These are um, areas of land in which cars are actually banned. The space has been pedestrianized. The pace slows down. And so and children play in the streets and they feel much more connected to fellow residents than they did before. In fact, research shows that on roads with less traffic, residents have three times the number of friends um, than people who live places where they have more cars. But it, it's also about um, reinvigorating, as you say, town centres and the main street, because those small interactions, what I call micro exchanges that we have as we walk into our local bookstore or our local um, butchers, that hello, how are you, that you might say at your local cafe where you go in and um, eat your pancakes. I mean, these interactions are hugely important in making us feel connected to each other. One of the things that you mentioned in the book I was really delighted to see was a a company in New York City called Hex & Co. that is a board game cafe. Well, it happens to be run by a very good friend of mine and a bandmate of mine. Uh, And the way you described it was, I thought, spot on. It's a place where people come and play all kinds of of board games from things in the Dungeons and Dragons realm to, you know, chess and go. But you stress the importance of people making time in their lives and businesses and communities setting up spaces for real human non-digital interaction. So critical. Um, I think it's something, you know, if you weren't convinced before the pandemic, having been forced to spend all our time doing interactions on Zoom and virtually, I think we're all really aware now that these relationships, they're better than nothing, are nothing nearly as good as face-to-face ones. And we need spaces where we can physically come together and be together, Um, whether they are um, escape rooms or music festivals or places like um, Hex & Co, or indeed, of course, public spaces, libraries, youth centres, All of these public spaces, what I call the infrastructure of community, have really seen funds taken away from them since 2008, since the financial crisis across the globe. And in the United States, you've numerous public libraries, for example, being closed down. Yet these places are vital places for people of all kinds to come together. And and I think if we're serious about a mission to reconnect society and unite, refunding the infrastructure of community really has to be at the heart of this agenda. Norina, you are obviously a well-connected person, a best-selling author, and how did you get interested in this topic? So there were three things really happening at roughly the same time. Uh, I was teaching at university, and what I realized was that more and more students were coming to me in office hours and confiding in me how lonely and isolated they felt. And this was new. I'd been teaching for 20 years, but 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 I hadn't seen this happen at the volume it was happening. Um, the other thing I noticed was that when I set group assignments to my students, many were finding it really hard to interact face-to-face in person. So that was one, aha, there's something going on here. The second was my research on right-wing populism, where I realized that loneliness was a key driver. And the third was I had bought and introduced into our home an Amazon Alexa. And I'm sorry, Mm. it's just going to go off now. Um, And I realized that I was becoming attached to my um, virtual assistant, you know, often just asking her a question or saying, hi, Alexa, how are you? Um, because because she was there and 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 it made me think about the role that artificial intelligence and social robots will increasingly play in mitigating our loneliness and the role that the market more generally um, can play in helping create solutions. It's something I talk about the loneliness economy. It's something that we saw rising even before the pandemic. That prompts perhaps a final question which is ourselves. How can we do better? How can we 
make ourselves more open to people who are lonely? So first, we can change the way we interact with others. Um, So part of this is as simple as putting our phones down more, being more present with each other, be there with them, really be there with them. Um, It's also about supporting our local um, areas, our local communities. I mean, Jim, you're right. I'm somebody who did pre-pandemic. I was flying around the globe the whole time. I saw myself very much as a global citizen. I didn't really think that much before I started researching my book about how important my local neighborhood, my local community was. But my research made clear how important local neighborhoods, communities are. The pandemic, of course, made made it even clearer. So we can really nurture and should nurture these, which means shopping at our local stores, but also showing up at local community events, initiating community events, this all makes a difference. Um, We can value kindness more, whether it's in our colleagues, our coworkers, our friends, our family. Um, We can actively think about whether there's someone in our own network who might be lonely, especially right now. Right now it's hard, particularly hard to be living on your own. So is there someone you could pick up the phone to, chat to if you are able to meet them in a socially distanced way meet up with them because just letting someone know that you see them that they're visible that you hear them that you care for them could make a huge difference well we've enjoyed chatting with you and being not alone even though we are in a sense doing this remotely in our remote studios thank you very much Norena Hertz thank you so much for having me on Norena Hertz Coming up next, our recommendation. Richard, I understand you have a rare double recommendation today. Yeah. Well, Wikipedia has just celebrated its 20th anniversary. And I know there are Wikipedia skeptics out there who say, how can you trust it? It's staffed by volunteers. But... Wikipedia has grown enormously in that 20 years, and its model of trust and cooperation has also been strengthened by a good deal more fact-checking. And I just think generally, of course, there are occasionally mistakes on Wikipedia and everywhere else, but generally it's, it's a wonderful source. Uh, of information. And Jimmy Wales, who was very much front and center and still is in the organization of Wikipedia, was a guest recently on a podcast um, called The Economist Asks that's hosted by uh, another Brit, uh, Anne McElvoy. And it's, it's well worth listening to just to hear that story. Jim, I agree with Norena Hertz when she says that loneliness is not a singular force, that it that it lives in what she calls an ecosystem. We do need economic and political as well as personal change and how we organize our society. Uh, one thing she mentioned was that federal funding for libraries uh, have has come down. Maybe that's one place that we start because libraries are in and of themselves acts of kindness. I love libraries. I actually spent, before pandemic, I, I spent a fair amount of time in, in my local library because, you know, when you work at home and you're by yourself, it's it's just nice to to get out and among other people, even strangers. This interview with Narena reminded me of some really great interviews we've done in the past uh, on this show. One was with the writer Keo Stark, who um, who wrote the book When Strangers Meet. I think it's called, and it's a lovely little book about those casual interactions with the person at the dry cleaner and the and the place where you pick up your coffee. And Narina was touching on that too. And as we move towards a society where everything's ordered online, everything's delivered by DoorDash, you know, I like going to my local sandwich shop and picking up my own sandwich. I don't want it delivered. You know? and, and then and then also, Jim, uh, other shows, uh, we spoke with John Haidt and, and Greg Lukianoff about loneliness among young people and, and the impacts of that on rates of depression and, and even suicide among young people. Yes. That, they're the co-authors of the very influential book, The Cobbling of the American Mind. And 
that book was misinterpreted by some who didn't really read it to think that they were somehow critical of this snowflake generation of college students. Quite the contrary. They're very concerned about the emotional and mental health challenges that young people are facing. But on the solution thing, I love this idea that there are small fixes. I'm, as you, of course, being the, the, uh, the skeptic about too much centralized government, I'm more inclined to say, how can a local community make sure that its downtown is, is accessible and, and, and prioritized for pedestrians? That's a big issue with me also as a, as a big bike rider. I think there also need to be big fixes as well. Uh, the way that capitalism has been organized in the last 40 to 50 years really needs to be questioned. Uh, that uh, the kind of capitalism that only emphasizes owners and not workers, that defines relationships in transactional terms and has led to the rise of many more people being freelancers in the gig economy. Yeah, well, people who, who want to put the blame on capitalism will like this book because that's a big theme of Narina's, what she calls neoliberalism as, as driving some of these trends. I'm somewhat skeptical on that, but I share with you the concerns about the gig economy. But what I think people often miss about capitalism is it gives people opportunities to do different things. You know, having a healthy economy and having people having good incomes can enable all sorts of other good things. You know, let's not throw out the system that allows us to to thrive and do the things we want to do. Let's make it better and let's use it to restore community. Our producer is Miranda Schaefer, and we're a production of Davies Content. Find out more about our podcasting consultancy at DaviesContent.com. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.